really needs no introduction. I, um, he speaks to a lot of my classes. I'm thrilled since he and you're lucky tonight that this is a brand new presentation he's never done before. Uh, he worked on it just for this occasion. Uh, he has gotten together a, a lot of his prints, and you have no idea what the job that is if you've ever seen his files of prints and negatives. It's just it's phenomenal how many images he's taken uh, over the past few decades. Um, for those of you who don't know Ed, he was with Life Magazine for 22 years, but he got his start here in Nashville with Tennessee for 13 years, and, um, and now he's back in school again at Nashville Tech and, uh, and helping us in our photo program. Um, he has gotten together uh, images uh, from Germany and, and, and on various subjects related to the subject of the evening. Um, I've been helping him with them a little bit and they are exciting and his stories that go with them are priceless. So um, without any further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Ed and we're going to take a second, we're going to record this, we're trying to get this set up. At first, I will admit we're going to have some lights that are going to be dimming and going out in a few minutes, but these lights will be dark, and the room should get darker as we go. This room has a safety feature. If you turn out the lights, some stay on. The batteries run out. It would be great in a fire, but it's terrible in a presentation. So we turned them out as early as we could. We were actually turning them out as students were finishing tests. <laughs> so I turned them out as early as we could without all the students having an excuse why they couldn't finish the test. So Ed, I'll turn it over to you and I'll get this darkened as much as possible. If I'd known I was going to live this long, I'd have taken better care of myself. <laughs> I'm, uh, when I think about it, uh, the, uh, last July I, was, I became 82 years old. I'm glad to be anywhere. <laughs> but when they asked me to do this Anne Frank thing, uh, I said, well, I don't know anything about Anne Frank except what I've read in the paper and, and her book. And I, it's been so long since I've read, I read, read her, her biography, uh, not biography, but her, her notes, that I, I forgot what, what she said. But, Anyway, I said, I don't have any, any excuse except that, that I was in Germany after the war. And they said, well, that's good enough, so that, that's what you're stuck with. <laughs> and I, it's not the, uh, some of the things that I have here tonight are, to me, they're funny anyway. I hope you'll laugh at the right time. But I, <laughs> not to, not to, to denigrate uh, Anne Frank at all, that these things are funny. Because I was at Nuremberg trials and I heard the awful, awful stories of the atrocities that were committed, and that's haunted me all ever since I've been there. And and I think it will continue to haunt me as long as I live. I, I just can't. Well, nobody can imagine what what uh, Hitler was thinking about. But there, that's what we stuck with. So we turned out the lights, and I only have a few a few pictures. But, and after this thing is over, if you if you think I can answer any of your questions, if you have any, well, I'll be glad to answer. I want to tell you one more thing. I insisted that Ed bring some of his books tonight. Oh, okay. He didn't have many, but if any of you were interested, his, his new book is, is back in the corner. Well, when you, when you get a foreign assignment, I was assigned from Nashville. I live in Nashville uh, working for Life magazine, but I wouldn't move to New York. So they, well, a lot of you have heard this story before, but some of you haven't. I'll, I'll, I'll take my chances and tell it again. But uh, I was recruited by Life when I was working for the Tennessee, and I was making, I was up to fifty dollars a week, and uh, I, I thought I was doing real well. And I went to New York. They said, "Come up there and get better clean." So I went up there, and they offered me a thousand dollars a month to come to work for me. And I, of course, I grabbed. I, I, I said, "Sure." And they said, "Well, when can you move to New York?" I said, "Oh, I couldn't do that." <laughs> <laughs> and I said, "Well, I said I can work for you out of Nashville." I said, "We don't have a single employee in the whole state. We're not going to start now." But anyway, uh, I said, "Well, I, I came back to my fifty-dollar-a-week job in Tennessee, and, 
and they kept sending me assignments. And I didn't know it at the time, but they were, they were shooting 10 stories for every one that got in the magazine. And I was getting in regularly, so they said, okay, Ed, you can live in Nashville. So I lived here seven, eight years. <laughs> and finally they got my attention, though. They said, if you don't move out of Nashville to some other place, and they offered me five, seven, five or six cities, said, we're never going to give you another raise, and I got my attention, so I moved. <laughs> <laughs> but the first thing you, when you're, when you're assigned overseas, first thing you want to know when you get there, what kind of transportation you have. So the first seven, eight pictures that I have tonight are, is my, me and my transportation. If you forgive me for being so personal, but that's what they consist of. And here's my first one. When, when I got through Paris, I said, what kind of transportation do you get? They said, oh, you got a Cadillac. I said, oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> they didn't tell me all, what kind of condition it was in, but I said, but a Cadillac is a Cadillac, you know. But this, is, this was uh, one of those cars that, uh, where the chauffeur sits up front, and there's a, a glass partition between the, the front and the back. And, uh, and the, back, the front seat is, is uh, leather, and the back seat is whip cord. Well, they didn't, also didn't tell me that a German general had, had been killed in this thing. It was full of bullet holes, and we had bullet holes all passed up. There was blood and all, blood all over everything in the back seat. And I left uh, Paris with, I had uh, seven, uh, what they call jerry cans. I, some of you know what jerry can is, hold five gallons of gas. I had seven of those in the back seat. And so it didn't, it didn't, the bug didn't bother me because I couldn't see it. <laughs> but anyway, we got to Epernay, and this car had, uh, well, I was, but anyway, it had, had uh, spare tires and fender wells on the side, I think. <laughs> but anyway, we got to Epernay, almost Epernay, and a tire blew up. So I got out and changed it. I had a spare, so I put it on, and went through Epernay. And another tire blew up. And I, I stopped. And by the way, the Cadillac didn't have any brakes on it. And it almost had to drag your foot to stop. But anyway, just as we stopped, we got it stopped. Another tire blew up. So we didn't. Uh, most, most, of, most of the time I was in, Paris, in, in Germany, that's the way I traveled. <laughs> but uh, Lee, I didn't come with, with me. And when we stopped it, it had two flat tires. We had one thing to do would, would fall off the side of the road. We couldn't pull off very far because the Germans still had mines all, all on the side of the road. There were signs like permachade things. I said, mine, I took I took them, mines, all up and down the, the road. So we didn't dare go very far off the highway. You can see the tire almost blew off the wheel. And, and he said, well, I have a bottle of cal Calvados in the car. I said, well, this is a good time to drink it. Said, to drink it. So we, we drank a bottle of cal Calvados, waiting for, for a truck to come by, an army truck to come by to drag us into a, to a place where we get get fixed, car fixed. So it's a, a, finally a, a, a wrecker came by and, and hauled us in, as you saw in that other picture before this, that picture. And we went into to a, what had been a had been a it was a, a chateau you know big uh, French place and and the Germans had, had been there and just as soon as they moved out the Americans moved in and so there was, the man in charge was Captain Clark and we became first cousins right on the spot <laughs> <laughs> and we called all over Europe trying to find some tires that fit this this car. Well, we couldn't find it, but, but the, uh, uh, Captain Clark had found out that in the caves around Epernay were the champagne, where they kept the champagne. So we stayed there for four or five days and drank champagne. <laughs> <laughs> All over Europe trying to get, a, get tires to fit this car. Finally, we couldn't find any, and Captain Clark said, well, I, I'll just uh, have the German prisoners of war put some, uh, they had a bunch of them there, they were mechanics, and said, I'll have them to put, uh, Jeep tires on, so we put four Jeep tires on, and they they would run me for about 250 miles, 
and then they'd blow clear off the wheel. <laughs> so on that trip, I blew out 16 deep tires on that trip. And when I got back to Paris, I said, I don't ever want to see this car again. Take it away. I don't want it. So they gave me a Persia. <laughs> that looked much better. <laughs> but that, I, I just fought with that car all the time. And well, that was up in Germany somewhere. But it, it, it would keep you warm anyway because the heater worked and, and the muffler didn't have a muffler on it, but it, it's a pretty noisy car. And finally they said, I said, I didn't want to ever see that Persia anymore. They said, well, we'll buy a Jeep then. And by that time, the Army was selling Jeeps for $250. They just had acres of them, acres and acres and acres. I said, go out and pick out one. So I picked out one. It had these, these sides put on, uh, some GI put on there. And also had a, 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 what they call a wire cutter on the top. You can't see it. Well, you can see part of it there. But uh, what, what the Germans did, they would, at night, they would stretch a wire across the road just about this height. And you come sailing down the road and just chop your head off. Oh, wow. and what they did was put a, 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 a metal bar out there with a hook on it that hooked the wire and it cut the wire and you go on through. I never did cut the wire on any of them, but that's, it happened a lot of times. Uh, that, that's me. I mean, I, I'm really a little bit embarrassed. Not much, but a little bit embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> I have so many pictures of myself. <laughs> <laughs> that's me at, at Hitler's headquarters and at the, what they call the crow's nest in Burgess Garden. That's his front porch. And it overlooked all of, all of a very beautiful, beautiful view from up there. But that's, and the, the inside of the bunker had just been wrecked, all, the whole thing had been wrecked, and Jazz had put graffiti all over everything up there. Now, I was, I was really, I was on my way up to, to Nuremberg to cover the trials, and so I was the first photographer to arrive there. So I appropriated a, a great big ballroom, this only about as big as this room, I guess, bigger. And uh, there were two beds in it. And, and a correspondent had come down, Carl McCarl had come down from Paris with me in, the, in that Jeep. And uh, so we, uh, there were two, two beds in there, two German beds. And the rest were German uh, cots. So I appropriated the whole room. So I said, nobody can be in there but, 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 but photographers. They said, all right. So I, 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 I slept in one of the beds and see that big, big stove. It was really cold. Cold winter, 45, and uh, so I, I pulled my bed right up next to the stove. You could lay your hand on the stove anytime, and, but it, it radiated a lot of heat. And actually, we were fairly comfortable in there. And Carl, uh, Carl McCarlow stuck in the other bed. And Carl McCarlow, they, they call him Flimsy McCarlow because he was a reporter for the uh, Philadelphia Bowl. And uh, they called him Flimsy because uh, the, the reporters would write uh, their stories, and 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 the, and the carbon, what they call a flimsy, and they just throw it in the in the, in the trash. And he'd go around and get all of them, and and from from what everybody else wrote, he'd write his story. <laughs> I did it, but he became assistant secretary of a, of a war after the <laughs> uh, That's that's a, a, a motley crew in, in Paris. Uh, uh, two, uh, Ralph Morris, the guy on the right there, as as photographer, and and me. Uh, I'm on the left if you don't recognize me. <laughs> and the rest of them are just office people who work for life. And that was our whole bureau. And this was a German band that played it for us at the at the uh, at, at the uh, Nuremberg trials. Every night we'd have dinner. By the way, that's, that's I, I had never met Walter Cronkite. Of course, he wasn't very well known. And Eric Severide. We all just were chums together in in this in the in the uh, mess hall at this Faber Castle where we lived. And all the there were. Correspondents there from all over the world, Chinese and 
of South Americans from everywhere. They came from everywhere. And they were all under the auspice of, of the Americans. Um, and they housed them and fed them and all that stuff. But uh, this band, this Oompa, as we call them, Oompa band, played every night for our dinner. <laughs> Now uh, this is a killing wall, I call it. This is where the, in, in Paris, this is after the, uh, during the war, the Germans would, would find uh, uh, accused the uh, French would have been collaborators and just summarily put them up against this wall and kill them, shoot them. Right. And so when the, when, they, when the Germans were thrown out, the French then uh, would kill uh, the ones that, uh, that they suspected that collaborating with the with the Germans, and they put them against the wall and shoot them. So that's a killing wall. Now, one, while I was in Germany, they told me that uh, uh, they wanted to do a. Uh, the Americans had 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 the scenery and the and the, the, the scenic part of Germany, and the Russians and the French and the and the English had the industrial complex, so we didn't have anything but scenery. And they said they wanted to send John Das, das Paso to work with me, and I would illustrate a story that he was going to write. I didn't know who John Das Paso was. And uh, so later I found out that he was one of the most highly respected journalists of, of the 20th century in this country. He long since been dead, I guess didn't make, make as much uh, uh, a reputation as uh, like I mean, we had him and some of those others, but Don Dos Passos, and I treated him, I didn't know who he was, and I treated him just like I would, uh, you know, a reporter from Tennessee or someplace, and I think he appreciated that, because I didn't, I didn't count out to him, he had been count out to, he was sick of it, so I just treated him like any other Joe that I met, and, and uh, he liked that, I think. But anyway, that's his story. The report on the occupation, and I, and I illustrated the story. And these are some of the pictures. We got all the scenery. And you see how beautiful that is? Uh, no bombs ever fought, 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 had fallen on that town. I don't know what town it was. I don't remember. And uh, they were, the farmers were still doing their crops. And uh, it was very peaceful in some sections. And all this, most, most of this in, in Bavaria, where the, 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 there was no reason to bomb Bavaria because it didn't have any industrial stuff there to bomb. And nothing I can say about these, but I, I don't know what I'm doing here in, in the first place. <laughs> But it sure was pretty. <laughs> I think those are beets. They, it's a cabbage, I forget which. But everywhere you look, they were beets and cabbage. Uh, the Germans just had, it was a cold winter, and that's about the only thing that they grew over there that, that, uh, that I saw harvest. That's along the Rhine River or some, some town. I don't know. I've forgotten what town. Do you know what town it is, Josh? Josh used to live there, but she doesn't know either. <laughs> Maybe so. Huh? Yeah, it was, it was, a, it was so cold, and, and the Germans were, were virtually starving to death, and the GIs would uh, army would would uh, load up a uh, load of potatoes and just dump them in the street. Any any all over Germany, just and anybody could come and, and get all they wanted. And see a fellow in the, in the on the right there. I don't know if a man or woman, but he's got a sack. He's going to fill up, big toe sack. All and the, the all the most most everybody's house had been bombed away. So. They had nothing left but the basement, and they couldn't cook in the basement because there was no way to get rid of the smoke, so they cooked above ground and slept down, down the basement. That's the way they lived. This is uh, King Ludwig, one of his castles, and, and he was a crazy king, you know, of Germany. And he had just, just one of his four or five, I don't know how many castles he had. He was 
kind of like his voters on his stamp. <laughs> <laughs>
when I tell you that now it goes to 4,000. You can understand why I didn't make a picture. But anyway, they turned the lights out and, and they were showing these films of the atrocities over there. And Gary was, took his handkerchief out and he was crying. Well, I couldn't make a picture of it because there wasn't enough light. That's one of the exhibits that they had at the Nuremberg Trials. And the bench of Belson saw this Jewish fellow in the camp there and she said, I want his head. And so she got his head and, and shrunk it. And that's, that was one of the exhibits that they had. She made lampshades out of tattoos and they had all the other stuff there. That's me photographing Gary. Now, some of you other people may have, may have forgotten or didn't know that Gary was committed suicide, and nobody could ever figure out how on earth he did it. And we don't know to this day. But uh, he was he was the rest of them were, a lot of them were hung, as you know, and he, he could see what was going to happen to him, so he committed suicide. That's the courtroom at Nuremberg. That's the last picture. Now this is Eisenhower in Germany. That shows how much how much times have changed since World War II. Uh, Eisenhower was welcomed in Germany. Uh, that's, that's it. Thank you very much.
Have you seen the gallery? Yeah, we just went to the gallery. It's directly across from the Thursday night. The show is at Carmatics, but the photo editor at 7 o'clock from 7 to 9. Going to I haven't spoken about four years ago, and I can't. All of the famous I photographs of the Stone, all the famous performers, and hilarious stories about how they have shot the photographs, how they, the problems they had in the session, and all of the, all of the Thank you very much. Thank you. I will try to do it. Lots of Thank you. Uh, famous people that have appeared in Rolling Stone are in there. Uh, the poster of the band. Thanks again. Yeah. Thank you. I'll look forward to seeing you next time. That's the only thing you really need to say. So, well, we'll see you soon. Bye. And then the next Tuesday, I'll go back and do duplicates. I see what duplicates are the ones that look really good and blow up the ones. And then, so it'll take me probably two or three more sessions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Did you get the photo? Now, who did the money? Thank you. Did you get the money? What post? No, give it to her. Give it to her. Give it to the wife. I should have known the wife would get it. Okay. Do I make it out of the hands? Did you get his granddaughter in any of these pictures? This is Ed Clark's granddaughter. Yes, I got her in there. Is she really? Is it really? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oh, excuse me. Okay, you're from Washington, right? Right, right, right. Right. <laughs> Joyce? <laughs> You have to go over there with your grandfather, but you can't get her just by herself. Oh, good. Oh, good. Oh, here? Oh, was he here? No. Oh, good. Good for him. And I'm, I'm his granddaughter. I'm in the photo class. We're going to make a photo class. We're going to make a photo class. We're going to make a photo class. Thank you, Vicki. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
we'll make it through. Okay, and Limbo. L I N D E L L. Limbo. On the first try, that's better than my family. I really appreciate your time. This was just true. I'm glad to. It's almost, you know, when you look at the pictures, they're if we see it often enough, we're going to be able to tell it. It's, it's true. <laughs> Never. It's funny. It's, uh, he has some pictures that he took from the air of Vanderbilt campus. Peabody campus. Mm -hmm. And it looks like it's out on a farm. Yeah. yeah it's just yeah. What, what what year, year was, was that? What year was it when you photographed? It must have been in the thirties, but I don't remember what year it was. It's amazing. About thirty four. Well, I think some of your pictures that you took. Huh? I think some of your pictures that you took of different things going on around Nashville and you were in Tennessee. I want to have a show of those sometime. Good. If I find a place to have them do it. I don't know where it would be, though. But I've got a lot of pictures of early Nashville. I know, and they were with my daddy. Oh, my daddy used to, because he was here from like 19. I don't know, early years. Well, Ed's been here for a lot of years. <laughs> yeah, I've been here a long time. <laughs> 82, that's well, great. Well, came. Uh, well, yeah, we well, enjoyed it, it as usual. usual. Thank you. Thank you. I haven't even seen I haven't seen these. Did they just put these up? <laughs> this was in that show downtown. I love this. Ed really needs no introduction. I, 
Um, he speaks to a lot of my classes. I'm thrilled since he and you're lucky tonight that this is a brand new presentation he's never done before. Uh, he worked on it just for this occasion. Uh, he has gotten together a lot of his prints, and you have no idea what the job that is if you've ever seen his files of prints and negatives. It's just it's phenomenal how many images he's taken uh, over the past few decades. Um, for those of you who don't know Ed, he was with Life Magazine for 22 years, but he got his start here in Nashville with Tennessee for 13 years, and, um, and now he's back in school again at Nashville Tech and, uh, and helping us in our photo program. Um, he has gotten together uh, images uh, from Germany and, and, and on various subjects related to the subject of the evening. Um, I've been helping him with them a little bit and they are exciting and his stories that go with them are priceless. So um, without any further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Ed and we're going to take a second, we're going to record this, we're trying to get this set up. At first, I will admit we're going to have some lights that are going to be dimming and going out in a few minutes, but these lights will be dark and the room should get darker as we go. This room has a safety feature. If you turn out the lights, some stay on. The batteries run out. It'll be bright enough. Uh, what the chauffeur sits up front is a, a glass partition between the, the front and the back. And, uh, and the, back, the front seat is, is uh, leather and the back seat is whip cord. Well, they didn't, also didn't tell me that a German general had, had been killed in this thing. It was full of bullet holes, and we had bullet holes all passed up. There was bloody and all blood all over everything in the back seat. And I left uh, Paris with, I had uh, seven, uh, what they call jerry cans. I, some of you know what jerry can is, hold five gallons of gas. I had seven of those in the back seat. And so it didn't, it didn't, the bug didn't bother me because I couldn't see it. <laughs> but anyway, we got to Epernay, and this car had the, well, I don't know, but anyway, it had, had the spare tires and the fender wells on the side, I think. <laughs> but anyway, we got to Epernay, almost Epernay, and a tire blew up. So I got out and changed it. I had a spare, so I put it on, and went through Epernay. And another tire blew up, and I, I stopped. And by the way, the Cadillac didn't have any brakes on it. And it almost had to drag your foot to stop. But anyway, this is we stopped. We got to stop. Another tire blew up. So we didn't. Uh, most, of, most of the time that I was in, Paris, in, in Germany, that's the way I traveled. <laughs> but of course, I grabbed. I, I, I said, sure. And they said, well, when can you move to New York? I said, oh, I couldn't do that. <laughs> and they said, well, I said, I can work for you out of Nashville. I said, we don't have a single employee in the whole state. We're not going to start now. But anyway, uh, I said, well, I, I came back to my $50 a week job in Tennessee, and they kept sending me assignments. And I didn't know it at the time, but they were, they were shooting 10 stories for everyone that got in the magazine. And I was getting in regularly, so they said, okay, Ed, you can live in Nashville. So I lived here seven, eight years. And finally they got my attention, though. They said, if you don't move out of Nashville to some other place, and they offered me five, seven, five or six cities, said, we're never going to give you another raise. And that got my attention, so I moved. <laughs> but the first thing you, when you're, when you're assigned overseas, first thing you want to know when you get there, what kind of transportation you have. So the first seven, eight pictures that I have tonight are is my, me and my transportation. If you forgive me for being so personal, but that's what they consist of. And here's my first one. When, when I got through Paris, I said, what kind of transportation do you get? They said, oh, you got a Cadillac. I said, oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> they didn't tell me all, what kind of condition it was in, but, I said, but a Cadillac is a Cadillac, you know. But this was, this was uh, one of those cars that... Fire is terrible in the presentation, so we turned them out as early as we could. We were actually turning them out as students were finishing tests. <laughs> so I turned them out as early as we could without all the students having an excuse why they couldn't finish the test. So Ed, I'll turn it over to you, and I'll get this darkened as much as possible. Okay. 
If I'd known I was going to live this long, I would have taken better care of myself. <laughs> I'm, uh, when I think about it, uh, the, uh, last July I became 82 years old. I'm glad to be anywhere. <laughs> but when they asked me to do this Anne Frank thing, uh, I said, well, I don't know anything about Anne Frank except what I've read in the paper and, and her book. And uh, it's been so long since I've read, I've read, read her, her biography, uh, not biography, but her, her notes. And I, I forgot what, what she said, but anyway, I said, I don't have any, any excuse except that, that I was in Germany after the war. And they said, well, that's good enough, so that, that's what you're stuck with. <laughs> and I, it's not the, uh, some of the things that I have here tonight are, to me, they're funny anyway. I hope you'll laugh at the right time. But I, <laughs> not to, not to, to denigrate uh, Anne Frank at all, that these things are funny. Because I was at Nuremberg trials and I heard the awful, awful stories of the atrocities that were committed, and that's haunted me all ever since I've been there. And and I think it will continue to haunt me as long as I live. I, I just can't. Well, nobody can imagine what what uh, Hitler was thinking about. But there, that's what we stuck with. So we turned out the lights, and I only have a few a few pictures, but. And after this thing is over, if you if you think I can answer any of your questions, if you have any, well, I'll be glad to answer. I want to tell you one more thing. I insisted that Ed bring some of his books tonight. Oh, okay. He didn't have many, but if any of you are interested, his, his new book is, is back in the corner. Well, when you, when you get a foreign assignment, I was assigned from Nashville. I live in Nashville uh, working for Life magazine, but I wouldn't move to New York. So they, well, a lot of you have heard this story before, but some of you haven't. I'll, I'll, I'll take my chances and tell it again. But uh, I was recruited by Life when I was working for the Tennessee, and I was making, I was up to fifty dollars a week, and uh, I, I thought I was doing real well. And I went to New York. They said, "Come up there and get better clean." So I went up there, and they offered me a thousand dollars a month to come to work for me. And I 